I'm Dave Spencer. Welcome to Gardening with Bugs. How to control thrips. Okay, I'm not going to lie, thrips control is a difficult one. Uh, outside, they have a natural tendency just to kind of blow into an area, cause all sorts of problems, but then kind of move on as well, and predators will follow them. There's only a few crops outside where, where thrips can really have a commercial effect. So when we talk about thrips control, we're usually talking about house plants like these that I have here, um, or in other protected areas like interior landscapes and commercial greenhouses. It's there that they find them, they find their way in, and they go without predators for some time, and their life cycle is quick enough, and the damage noticeable enough that you end up with a quite a loss of product, um, either in ornamentals because of the damage, or in some cases you get you end up with curled. Uh, deformed uh, fruits and vegetables as well. Now there's a huge variety of thrips and I don't, there are thrips professionals. There's somebody I follow on on Twitter that is like the king of, of thrips knowledge. Um, I'm not going to go into all that kind of stuff, but there are things like a kind of thrips and uh, uh, just a, a wide variety, ones that will affect fruits and vegetables more so, and then the ones that affect ornamentals. Typically, like here in Canada and, and the Midwest of the U.S. Um, or throughout sort of the northern part of the U.S., the main thrips um, that we're worried about are the onion thrips and the, and the western flower thrips. Now, they are indistinguishable to the naked eye. In fact, even with a microscope, they're almost impossible to tell the difference. It really comes down to a little dot on the head of one of them. Um, commercially, there is an important difference, and that is that you can spray and kill onion thrips, but there are no sprays that work against the western flower thrips. So that one really has people worried. It has all sorts of um, solutions coming out of the woodwork in terms of how to control these things. I will share with you what has worked in commercial uh, indoor landscapes as well as commercial greenhouses. Uh, but like I said, I, I can't say it's easy. There, it's, it's multifaceted and its life cycle alone will make that evident. So thrips adults are small. Well, the thrips are small in general. I mean, if you can see them on the leaf, it's because you have a problem. Uh, otherwise, they're pretty, they're pretty hard to find. Uh, but they are the, obviously the biggest life stage. They're winged, although you'll notice that the wings aren't really full. They're not meant to fly. They're actually just meant to stretch out with those kind of uh, feathery looking uh, tips in order to get different electromagnetic um, charges and levitate. In fact, in other parts of the world, they're known as thunderbugs for their um, coincidence of, of traveling with atmospheric convection. So like a thunderstorm rolls down, you get that sort of charge in the atmosphere uh, that allows them to levitate. And then with those winds, they kind of blow in. And that is typically when people notice an infestation is, is a sudden weather change, usually with high winds. Um, where, where I live, mostly it comes when people mow a field or something like that. It kind of pushes them into adjacent greenhouses. But anyways, they're winged, and uh, that's usually when they come into your house, if they haven't come in on the plant material to begin with. Uh, they don't, so they don't really fly, they kind of tumble. So what actually is the source usually is just your front door, whatever door you use. They usually just come in with you along the ground, especially when they're in the summertime when you kind of have drafts coming in and out, you can kind of suck them in. So they end up inside the house. What they do is lay their eggs inside the plant tissue. And here's why thrips control is complicated right off the bat is that there's not a lot of predators. In fact, there's none really that I'm familiar with except maybe some parasitoids that will attack the eggs in the plant tissue. So they're relatively safe. Now those eggs, when they hatch, they end up with a first instar larva, which is just a fancy way of saying there's, there's different stages. And the first stage is usually within the plant material. It will eventually emerge. And then the larval stages, the rest of the larval stages end up on the plant tissue. So other than the damage within the leaf, which the first instar does, after that, they kind of have a scraping tendency. So they're not a sucking insect, 
like aphids or white fly where they don't attach their mouthpiece into the plant and, and draw out the foam they tend to have a scraping nature and so the damage does look a little bit different a little bit more contoured than like the modeled markings that spider mite would leave behind uh, so that's sort of your first telltale sign and then if you are looking at the damage you should be able to see the long little sl like slivery type uh, larva and they're quite quick the other interesting thing about their life cycle is when they go to pupate so this is the period between the last larval stage and them emerging as new adults that has to take place in the soil in the case of the onion thrips and the western flower thrips so again whatever predators are used to finding them on the leaves are not the same ones that are going to find them in the soil so again this complicates how we control them finally after the pupation of soil in the soil they emerge as adults ready to to take off again so let's think about that life cycle in terms of of how we're going to control them so yes in theory at any point if you had the ability to disrupt that life cycle entirely you should be able to stop them so number one for any interior plant scape or house plant is the predatory soil mite stradiolalaps schematis or if you're in canada Geolalaps gillespie is actually a better option for thrips control but those have to be in the soil of your plants and you've heard me talk about them before because they're there for fungus gnats anyways so i'm hoping that you're watching this you're already like check we've got that one done if you don't do it because even like with the original tests on thrips pupating thrips predation in soil geolalaps gillespie was 80% effective at just reducing thrips pressure right there. And that's a big number for pest control. So that's where we're going to start. So if you can get those guys into this soil right there, you're going to stop a whole bunch of that cycling, the emerging of new adults, which can lay hundreds of eggs. So right there, you've kind of stopped it. So the next thing to do is stop the adults to begin with. And this is where it's really difficult. Thrips are attracted to plant material typically because of like smells or like it's, it's hard for me just to use the word smells. I don't want to get too technical, but basically different compounds that the, the plants can put off. Um, and there's a bunch of things that go into that. A, a stressed plant can give off different smells and actually produce different wavelengths of light uh, that can attract different insects. Um, so thrips can be controlled, can be attracted by all those things, but primarily they're attracted to like flowers and strong scents. Um, and is some colors, which we'll talk about in a sec. So one of the first things we do, and we do this with commercial growers as well, is if you're worried about adult thrips coming through the door, the first thing you do is get a bowl, like especially like a shallow pan of water, add some dish soap in it enough to kind of get rid of the surface tension, and then just a few drops of some sort of floral or natural extract like the easiest thing to do and the reason we recommend this is because everyone has some of it is in the in the cupboard in your kitchen just grab some like almond extract or vanilla extract or peppermint extract those ones work fine um, or if, if you don't have those something like a floral based perfume might might be easier for you so what you do is you've attract right there that smell in that room is going to attract them to the water they'll land in there and drown because you've broken the surface tension with the soap. Now, why we recommend that is two things. Yes, you're going to trap them. You're not going to trap them all. So it's not, it's not the be all end all of a trap of capturing adults, but it's also a monitoring tool. So sometimes you'll see growers have these near the, near the doors or the bays that they open to bring the trucks in or something like that. They have them on the floor and it's a monitoring, monitoring tool. So that morning when the IPM or the head grower walks in and takes a look at that and he says, okay, there's three thrips today, no problem. Next day, there's three more thrips, no big deal. Day after that, maybe we'll change up the, the scent. We'll empty that out. We used almond. Now we're going to switch it up, which is important to do. Um, then suddenly you get 50. Then you know it's time, that, time to react inside the greenhouse with some sort of alternative method. Um, otherwise, if you've got just small plants like I do in the house plant, then just on the floor, putting that little soapy tray there, you will catch some adults. And again, it's also your monitoring tool. So that's the other step. What people have done in the past too, and it's still really common in, in, um, in greenhouses, is, is to buy a flowering plant. Like just go at the grocery store, grab one of those little potted roses, something that has a really nice smell. Bring it in. Sometimes they're toxic anyways with, with, with sprays. So uh, you don't necessarily want to put it right, right against some of your plants because you don't want to end up killing beneficial insects that might be there anyways. 
uh, but they, they could be attracted to that. They might go into the rose head. You can just simply take that plant out after a couple days, check, see if they're in there, and then dispose of it or put it outside. And that's a pretty common practice as well. Some of the other ones that are best for that is like yellow pom-pom marigolds. You'll see those again with commercial growers right near the door. And it just looks like a nice way to place to put flowers. But of course, they're actually trapping and monitoring thrips. If you can't see them in there, you just tap the flower on your hand and you'll see them kind of running around. And you know it's time to get rid of that plant and replace it with a fresh one. So you've gone and trapped a few adults. Um, that's great. Uh, after that, they, um, the predation of adults is actually kind of the more difficult one because they are the fastest and the strongest and, and they have the ability to get away from a lot of the predators. Uh, there are big thrips predators that are, are very good, like Aureus, for example. You're, you might be familiar with the mining pirate bug. So it's a great thrips predator. Um, we don't recommend it in terms of biocontrol because it, it's, it's hard to establish in, a, in any area with thrips long enough to get a result, long enough to get a result. So it's, it's better if you, know, if you just put that plant outside for a little bit and the natural ones show up, you'll get kind of a better cycling and it's, it's far less expensive. Um, what's better is some of the other ones like um, Anistis Pacarum, the crazy mite, where you could just put it in the house like this as long as you're not worried about them crawling around elsewhere because they are a relatively large mite. So if you don't want bugs in your house, that's not a great start. Uh, but it can kind of roam around your plant and take out some of the adult thrips. Otherwise, the adults themselves, it's, it's sometimes easier just to, just to trap them and know that you're going you're gonna to control thrips elsewhere. Um, the last thing I, f I forgot to mention is, of course, those sticky cards are the best. Um, again, a monitoring tool, always write the date on it, stick it in there, and then that way you can see how thrips populations have increased or decreased over time. Um, there's always been that debate about what color to use. Uh, one of the um, researchers at Vineland Research in Ontario uh, tested a whole bunch of them and found that yellow was, was actually the best for thrips, despite there being this belief that blue was better for thrips. What she found was blue was, um, was more selective, so thrips and fungus gnats liked it, and so sometimes it was easier to count them. But in general, yellow attracted the most bugs, including the most thrips, but it made it more difficult to count because you were catching all sorts of other bugs as well, including some beneficials. But that never really seemed to be a problem because she could prove that the number of beneficials stuck to the card was still insignificant compared to the number of adults that were attracted. So you should also get those, put them in your, in your pot. I mean, any flying insect that you're gonna catch in your house is probably a pest unless you've gone and released some beneficial insects that fly, but typically people don't want flying predatory mites and insects in their insects in your, in your house. So always try to trap those flying guys. But yeah, so other than that with the adults, um, it's important just to skip ahead to the next life cycle. If they can, if the, you can trap the adults and there's predators that you're willing to release that are going to eat the adults, that's great, but you get far more success in the larval stage. So the next one you have to use is Cucumeris. Now this is a widely used commercially available predatory mite. It's super cheap because it's very easy to rear in high numbers. Um, it's primarily used for thrips. It is a thrips control, but you'll find it also eats things like white fly scale, um, broad mites, russet mites, a whole bunch of aerified mites. So it's really your in indoor plant's best friend. I can't stress that one enough. You can get them little sachets. Um, the smaller the sachet, the worse usually. So try to get like a larger sachet if you do that and just buy fewer of them. Or just get the loose material and shake it to the base of the plant. They'll crawl up. Now they, they specialize in eating the first stage larva when they come out of the plant tissue. So remember the eggs are laid in the plant tissue, the larva hatch, do some damage within the leaf, and then they have to come up. Cucumeris shows a tendency to not care about the eggs or the larva when they're within the when when they're within the plant tissue, but as soon as they start emerging, the cucumeris literally just walk around and bite their heads off. It's sort of gruesome, but it's highly effective. And the nice thing is when you're going to get like a liter of, of Cucumeris, it's 50,000 mites. And we're talking about less than a bottle of any spray, obviously, they're going to use like very cheap. So 50,000, that'd be enough for a thousand square feet. So you can imagine how, how little you need to have that sort of control in your plants. The only drawback with applying Cucumeris in those high numbers 
is they'll immediately run out of food. Like unless you have a massive thrips infestation, in which case forget everything I said and just put the plant outside and hope it survives. But you'll never really have that sort of that sort of pest load to sustain those populations. So what tends to happen with cucumeris is you just have to reapply it every few weeks. But again, it's super cheap and that shouldn't be a drawback. And I know sometimes ordering beneficial is a hurdle, especially for homeowners um, where it's not a commercial venture. They don't even know who to call. Um, it sounds like a hurdle, but I promise once you get the person that you need to, to deliver those bugs for you or the place that you're going to go pick them up, it just becomes kind of clockwork and it has to be done. After that, we know, thanks to Vineland research, that the combination of Cucumeris and Anisus buccarum is actually the best thrips control base compared to all the other ones. So, like I said, if you can't use Anisus buccarum to take care of the bigger ones, and you're just going to go with Cucumeris, the soil mite, and then some traps, you're probably fine. But if you do have the ability to add the Anisus buccarum to your plant, the crazy mite, then that's going to go around any of the thrips that are missed by the cucumeris this this late second kind of third instar the cucumeris will still eat the second instar so the kind of the later ones and of course the adults you can take care of those with anistus becarum so yes that's super complicated but it's, uh, i almost i almost hate broaching the subject um i especially do hate responding by emails because i have to type this whole thing out all the time because it's not a simple answer it's not like spider might put phalasis on it, problem solved. Um, thrips is a constant battle. And you do, in my opinion, you need all of these steps. You might be able to get away with some of them by skipping some of them, but any thrips in your house is going to multiply. It's going to cause you problems. So you kind of have to get rid of it. Like there's almost a zero tolerance for that pest. Whereas there isn't really zero tolerance in my mind for something like spider mite. If there's a bit of spider mite alive and there's a bit of flasis in there feeding on it and keeping their populations in check, you're never going to have a spider mite problem. Um, it's not always the same with thrips. You do want them out of your house. So if you're dealing with thrips in a greenhouse, it's far easier. Uh, Cucumeris is still the best answer. It's the cheapest. You can buy a bag, like a liter bag. Like I said, 50,000 mites, it's a thousand square feet and you can hand broadcast it. Just throw it on your plants. Problem solved. Um, sort of, you still want an Eastus Picarum, obviously to clean up some of those adults and then those trapping techniques still work. So consider the house plant and the greenhouse option sort of the same uh, the only difference is you're probably more keen to put bugs in the greenhouse than you are in the house and that's fine so you may want to start with with um, just the soil mites and trapping in your house if that's what you choose to do outside thrips is not a, a not a huge problem except for in a couple crops where people have sprayed it with pesticides and i know you're not here just to hear about how bad pesticides are you've probably heard that before uh, but keep this in mind thrips have a tendency to come in and just go they're food for all sorts of predators. So if you had the ability just to leave them, let the predators kind of show up and let the let the thrips take off, uh, you're going to get more success out of that. But not everyone has that luxury, of course, right? If you've got something like strawberries, uh, the neighbor's going to cut the cut the grass, you're going to have all these thrips come in and they're going to deform the fruit because they, they attack the flowers and then the fruit ends up kind of misshapen sometimes. Um, you know, you can't, that's a, that has a major economical um, impact on you. So obviously you can't do that. So you do have to use these beneficial mites and the same thing. And the best thing you can do is find out who your neighbors are, uh, if they're going to mow the lawn or what their crops are, if they've got like alfalfa or something like that, something that's kind of harboring a lot of thrips, um, become friends with them, let them know that you need to do some protective measures if they are going to do any major work on the field. Um, and then get these predatory mites in like that day or the day of, and then that way you can really reduce the damage. So to recap, the thrips uh, control is, is so difficult. It's, uh, I'm sorry to say, it's not, it's not an easy one. Uh, you have to, right off the bat, let's pretend you don't have thrips. You gotta trap it. So use the soapy water with the, with the extracts in it to try to attract them. Um, I didn't mention this before, but on those sticky cards, what some growers have done to, to really maximize the, the attractant to adult thrips is by putting uh, just a little cotton ball in the middle of it and adding those same drops of extract right to that sticky card. And they found that they get more, uh, get more thrips that way. Um, also, 
you should always place those low. I also didn't mention that. Like I said, the thrips don't really fly. They just kind of tumble along. Um, there's been lots of studies where we put yellow sticky cards like hanging below a bench of like, in this case, it was um, raised strawberry beds inside. Um, the, and the cards that were lowest to the ground had the more, most thrips. So if you stick a yellow card up here high in the canopy of the plant, you're going to catch all sorts of flying insects like fungus gnats. If you stick it down lower, you're going to catch some fungus gnats obviously as well, but that's where you're going to get the thrips. So d make sure that you keep those kind of low in the canopy as low as you can. If you use yellow sticky tape like in a greenhouse, make sure that's right along the ground. So trap those adults. Then is, and use that as a monitor tool. And as soon as you see them, at least get Cucumeris, the predatory mite for thrips. After that, your choice of getting Anisus becarum, and then some, for some reasons, I'd say have it anyways, because it's gonna eat all sorts of things like aphids as well. Um, but that one's sort of your choice because they do spread out and they are quite a bit more expensive. But Cucumeris, absolutely. That should be it for your thrips control. But remember this also, we get, we get so attached to our house plants. Uh, there's no reason, except in the harsh winter, to just put that plant outside and attract predators to the thrips anyways. You will get natural predators. The only risk with that is then when you bring it inside, maybe you have new pests as well, like scale and mealy bugs. So really that, uh, that action of going in and out is not the best, but if, I, if it was between, for me, between saving a plant that I really care about, like these, 10 year old coffee plants um which don't have pests anyways um you know i'd be tempted to see see what's gonna happen by putting them outside just to see if i can save them that way remember the only reason like we the only reason we really have pest problems is because we have tried to restrict them if we just let everything have a free-for-all it all balances out there's just small corrections we need to make because we are trying to produce something outside of the natural zone typically <laughs>